Good morning. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines. Udhav Thakre will be sworn in as the new Chief Minister of Maharashtra on Thursday after the Mahavikas Agadi, comprising of the Shiv Sena, NCP and Congress, stake claim to form the government. Yes Bank will hold a board meeting today to consider raising of funds. CSB Bank's 410 crore IPO gets a strong response, receives bids for over 100 crore shares against a total issue size of 1.15 crore. Asian markets see modest gains at the start of trade as US President Trump says trade negotiations are in their final stages. And cab aggregator Ola starts enrolling drivers in London as Uber uh, loses its license to operate there. Let's talk about the US markets now. US markets continued to extend their gaining streak on Tuesday. Benchmark indices posted moderate gains and hit yet another record closing high. Abigail Doolittle wraps up Tuesday's Wall Street, Wall Street action in this report. Stocks finished slightly higher in Tuesday's Wall Street session. The Dow, the S&P 500, and the Nasdaq all climbing by about two-tenths of one percent. Now, this was enough for new record highs uh, for these three major averages on a lack of any bad news, really. Investors waiting for some sort of uh, news around a possible phase one trade deal between the U.S. and China. Uh, but the melt-up that we've seen, stocks just levitating higher after uh, the third quarter earnings season seems to be coming in and has come in uh, less bad than feared. And perhaps an economy that's slowing down a little bit, but it's not a meltdown, stocks climbing higher. That being said, uh, lifting the lid a little bit, there are some nuances given the fact that bonds, haven bonds rallying at the same time over the last 11 session, the 10-year yield falling nine of those 11 sessions, including on Tuesday. That really influenced the sector composition, slightly defensive in fact. Now eight of the 11 sectors for the S&P 500 climb, but up top were some of the defensive sectors such as uh, real estate, consumer staples and utilities. Those sectors, those companies offer high dividends. So investors buy those stocks uh, when rates are falling, as is the case right now. As for some outsized movers on the day, Dollar Tree, the discount uh, retail store, those shares plunged down 15 percent at the lows, down 17 percent. At that point, on pace for its worst day since 2001, just to give you an idea of the magnitude uh, of the drop intraday. Uh, and this came on a somewhat disappointing quarter, more so on the outlook being cut, tariffs being blamed in part on the cost of goods uh, rising. However, there were some big retail winners, including Dick's Sporting Goods. That stock was up almost 20 percent. They put up a solid quarter, beating comp sales estimates. They also raised the comp view. And Best Buy, up about 10 percent, uh, they did quite well. Uh, they beat uh, comp views and uh, raised that outlook. So uh, some winners and losers beneath the lid. Relatively flat surface for the S&P 500. Again, climbing by about two-tenths of 1 percent. Record high there. But again, remember, Haven Bonds climbing at the same time. Tuesday's Wall Street uh, risk appetite, probably just about neutral. From New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. All right, and seemingly that's uh, the tone that Asian markets are picking up as well. Let's take a closer look. I'm joined live by Rosalind Chin from the Bloomberg Studios in Hong Kong. Good morning, Rosalind. A lot of markets uh, coming on stream as of now. Is that the tone that you're picking up as well? Well, what we're seeing is that Asian markets, broadly speaking, have been making uh, some modest gains this morning with the MSCI Asia Pacific Index up by about a quarter of 1%. Now, though, that we see Hong Kong and China coming online, uh, both of those markets opening lower. Well, uh, Hong Kong, uh, yeah, just about flat right now, but dipping into negative territory. So that may have an impact uh, on how uh, the Asian region will fare a little later in the session. So right now, let's take a look around. We've got the Nikkei making gains of about uh, a third of 1%, as is the Topics Topics poised for four days of gains of course after President uh, Trump said that talks with China on the first phase of a trade deal were near completion so that giving a little bit of a boost to sentiment. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Hong Kong index uh, dipping into negative territory. Not a lot here moving the markets uh, at the moment. Uh, in Korea the Kospi index is gaining about a third of one percent as well. We saw some consumer confidence numbers out from South Korea basically 
improving for a third month and signaling some optimism for the first time really since April. Uh, the expectations for easing global trade tensions and then economic recovery really uh, helping there. Uh, we want to look at Australia because that uh, S&P SX200 is making gains of about two-thirds of one percent. But we did see some movement on Aussie bond yields. Uh, that is after some comments from uh, Philip Lowe, the RBA governor, at a speech. So the yield on three and ten-year notes uh, slipped at the open. Of course, that follows those moves in treasuries that we just heard about as well. But uh, Philip Lowe did say that uh, it uh, would be a bigger step to engage in money financed asset purchases by the central bank than it is to cut interest rates. He also said that uh, QE would be considered at a cash rate of about 0.25%, uh, but the conditions were not there yet. The threshold for that kind of stimulus had not yet been reached. So we saw some movement there. And of course, Westpac still under pressure as uh, powerful shareholder advisors call for more changes to the board. That's, of course, after the CEO. Brian Hartz uh, resigned, was forced to quit after allegations from the Financial Crimes Agency of breaching money laundering laws, the agency, the, uh, rather the lender, breaching money laundering laws 23 million times. Um, there is a Westpac AGM on the 12th of December, so that uh, stock there still a little bit under pressure today. So overall, uh, a rather mixed picture for Asia, and uh, with the opening, of course, of uh, Hong Kong and Chinese markets, uh, that may drag a little bit on the overall performance. Back to you. Thanks so much for that, Rosalind. All right, trade optimism is seemingly back yet again. U.S. President Donald Trump has said that the phase one deal with China is in its final stages. Negotiation, uh, or negotiators from both sides had a telephonic conversation where consensus was apparently reached on resolving core issues. Jody Schneider of Bloomberg News tells us more. Both sides are saying, again, they're down to the last details, although we've heard this for a while. Uh, President Trump, October 11th, uh, told us this. Hmm. But apparently, uh, they are down to the last details, and that includes how much goods, how, uh, the amount of goods that China uh, will buy in terms of uh, U.S. For farm products, uh, billions of dollars worth is what the U.S. wants, uh, and uh, how it would work in terms of their agreement to strengthen uh, U.S. Uh, protections of U.S. intellectual property rights. Mm. On the U.S. side, China is demanding that they uh, roll back the tariffs and don't impose any new ones. How that rollback will occur apparently is part of the negotiations. And then, of course, where and when to, to actually sign the agreement. Things have been complicated uh, somewhat, too, by uh, the situation in Hong Kong and U.S. support, including that legislation uh, in Congress for pro-democracy efforts in Hong Kong. Yeah, Jody, it's interesting. Trump hasn't signed off on it yet, but essentially he has a few days on which to sign off on it or goes back to the House, right? So how is that proving a hurdle, as it were? We've seen the ambassador here in Beijing, the U.S. ambassador, getting a dressing down, of course. The rhetoric is being very fierce, and China's threatened retaliatory measures, of course. But is it really holding talks back at this stage? Well, Tom, it's unclear. Certainly, it's, it's complicating them. This is, you know, an issue that they've tried to separate the negotiators uh, in recent months, uh, Hong Kong, from the talks and the uh, details of how they would come to this agreement. But it's become increasingly difficult to separate those uh, because of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Congress passage of that bill, which, uh, as you know, China has said that uh, they, they have very much criticized and said they would impose strong countermeasures. Uh, uh, if that was to be passed, it was passed. Now President Trump is faced with the awkward situation of this bill sitting on his desk as he tries to finalize this deal with, uh, with Chinese negotiators. Now, while the Saudi Aramco IPO is getting tepid interest from across the globe, Abu Dhabi is planning to invest as much as $1.5 billion in what is already touted to be the world's largest IPO. Dan Murtag of Bloomberg News is, has more details. Pretty big for the Saudis in terms of saving face. You know, they, they started talking about this IPO more than two or three years ago, and it was such a big deal. It was going to raise two billion or two trillion dollar valuation. It was going to raise a hundred billion dollars. The the country was going to get away from oil and gas, and then just for a variety of reasons uh, that are too long of a list to get into now, it's just failed almost at every single level. And more recently, the company has had to turn away from international investors and start 
weighing uh, heavily on local investors in Saudi Arabia to try to raise just $25 billion uh, in the IPO, which is a fraction of what they originally thought that they were going to get at a lower valuation. So finally getting a foreign company, even one that's a neighbor and ally like the uh, Abu Dhabi, is a little bit of a face saver for, for Saudi Arabia in this. So, uh, Dan, why is uh, Abu Dhabi interested in the IPO? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question, Paul, because you have Saudi Arabia on the one hand, an oil-rich state in the Middle East that is trying to sell part of its oil company to raise money to get away from oil. And then you have Abu Dhabi, which is an oil-rich emirate in the Middle East, which is now investing in oil. So it's clearly there, there's not some sort of strategic hedging uh, option here that Abu Dhabi is doing. Uh, you know, most likely the, the crown prince of Abu Dhabi, uh, MBZ, is... is friendly with uh, Saudi Arabia's crown prince, MBS, and this seems like it is sort of uh, a more political uh, weighed idea to, to sort of reach across to a neighbor and give them a little bit of a boost than any kind of strategic investment for Abu Dhabi. All right, let's see how that pans out. Meanwhile, let's take you through the, uh, the news that's making headlines across the globe. Sue Keenan of Bloomberg News brings you the first word headlines. A White House budget official says he warned his superiors that a hold on security aid for Ukraine could be illegal, and he waited months for an explanation for any response. Mark Sandy was at the Office of Management and Budget and told the House impeachment inquiry that officials were told back in mid-July that President Trump had directed that the aid be held up. He added that no reason was given for the delay. To the UK now, sterling weekend as surveys indicated Boris Johnson's Conservative Party may be losing its lead ahead of next month's election. Investors most fear an inconclusive result next month, and the polls show Labour making up some ground. A hung parliament raises the prospect that the impasse over Brexit will drag on into the new year. Sterling has gained nearly 8% since September's three-year low. Meanwhile, the week-long siege at Hong Kong's Polytechnic University seems to be winding down with a search of the campus, finding just one person remaining. The university said there may be still another person there, and the university uh, is trying to uh, see if anyone is avoiding arrest. Finally, to Hong Kong's exports, they declined for a 12th straight month in October, with the city mired in recession amid the ongoing trade war and the pro-democracy unrest. Shipments shrank to 44.5 million U.S. dollars, a 9% drop from a year ago, and worse than forecast in a Bloomberg survey. Imports also fell by 11.5% from a year ago, narrowing the trade deficit to about 4 billion U.S. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Sue Keenan. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's turn now and take a look at the Indian markets and how they're fare faring. Agam Vakil is here to tell you all about that in the trade setup of the day and also what's happening in the futures and options space. Agam, uh, big talking points yesterday during the session hit uh, li lifetime highs and then came off that yeah. level. And then Reliance Industry is missing out by one rupee. Yeah. So, but how are we looking at the start today? Well, uh, it's a wait and watch, Alex, because uh, there was uh, weakness in the last 15, 20 odd minutes with some amount of momentum. Uh, but for now, we are looking at a possibility of the indices opening in the red, though we really can't go consider, uh, with the SGX Nifty futures considering it is only marginally down for now. But, uh, you know, as we were talking about yesterday, we did see the Nifty come off by a little, let, 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 less than over about a quarter percent and uh, the mid cap and small cap indices falling in tandem in fact a little more than the benchmark indices the banking indices too well showing a mixed uh, well move up with the nifty banking index specifically in this case uh, moving higher on account of some of the private sector names but moving on in terms of ADRs, well, again, we have a mixed day of trade today. We do have 
declines in ICICI Bank and HDFC Bank. On the other hand, or pardon me, an advance in ICICI Bank and HDFC Bank. On the other hand, Vedanta and Tata Motors showing some weakness here. Uh, we also have weakness in Infosys, Wipro, and Dr. Reddy's advancing by around 2.5%. But, uh, you know, in terms of fund flows, there were a lot of bulk deals and there was a lot of exchange between FIIs and DIIs, which is why you're seeing uh, that number of 4,678-odd crores worth of buying from the FIIs. DIIs, on the other hand, selling to the tune of 4,242-odd crores. Moving on, uh, we do have, well, the nifty contributors in terms of the, the banks. As I was suggesting, a handful of banks keeping the, the nifty banking index higher. On the other hand, weakness in the IT space, some heavyweights like TCS era and Infosys weighing down on the indices. Moving on to, well, for your futures and options space, and uh, well, it is expiry week. We're looking at rollovers picking up currently at around 45%. Uh, moving on, uh, as far as the nifty banking fu futures go, the rollover standing at around 40%. Again, largely in line with the uh, previous three-month average for both the nifty and the bank nifty futures. The 12,000 mark remains the one with the maximum open interest in terms of the 12,000 put specifically. And on the higher end, again, <coughs> pardon me, it's a tad open. But this is where the December futures, or rather the December options open interest comes into play. We'll talk about that, but in, in just but on the whole, we have seen unwinding in 11,900 put, and that is important because the Nifty came off, and that is why we saw unwinding coming through there. And you know, once again, uh, well, the Wix came off by around 1%, back below the mark of 15. Do remember that this is, it may be taken as precarious because uh, a lot of traders out there are now e expecting the, the Wix to move up higher, which means that there could be some volatility in stores. You never know. But uh, the Nifty put call ratio at uh, 1.59 against 1.7 month, just coming off tad, a tad bit. And in terms of stocks, let's take a look at what we are watching out for. Yes, Bank, of course, uh, it did see a lot of rollovers. We did see just a 1% drop there, but there was a lot of change in, you know, in terms of stock futures. Moving on, uh, we're also keeping an eye on Grasim. Of course, rollover standing at around 76%. So there's a significant pickup there. Uh, BPCL also uh, we're watch, watching out for uh, where we saw about 64% rollovers. Bharti Infratel has been in focus along with Bharti in Airtel, in fact, and a lot of volatility, a lot of jumps on the higher end as well as the lower end for, well, both these counters for that matter. And uh, well, so these, and of course, we also have Adani Enterprises, which has seen some short buildup off late. So, Alex, a, a lot of mixed moves yesterday, and I would say the market is, seems very split on the Nifty going higher and the other half expecting the Nifty go, low, go lower. Let's going to have to wait and watch as to mm. who wins eventually in this. All right. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Meanwhile, let's uh, look at some of the stocks that are likely to be buzzing in trade today. Somit Sarkar is here with the Stocks in News. Somit, good morning. What's on your list today? Uh, good morning, Alex. Firstly, I'll start off with Desbank. A uh, couple of news on that counter. Firstly, the board will be meeting on November 29 to consider fundraising. Along with that, yesterday in the Baldil integrated core strategies bought nearly 4.7 crore shares where BlackRock was the seller and also the stock has entered the FNO ban. Presti Rested Project, they have signed an agreement with Marriott International to open six new hotels across India, representing nearly 1,000 rooms. Now, all hotels are expected to open between 2021 to 2025. REC and PFC will be in focus on the back of the Bloomberg News where they are saying that the government of India has asked REC and PFC and Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency to lend more than 1 billion US dollars to state distribution utilities. Now, the funding will help uh, the distribution agents to, uh, agencies to clear their dues to renewable power generators. CMAC, because they have deployed its vessel to Posh subsea for a charter value of around 4.86 million US dollars and a couple of stocks that would also be in focus on the back of the brokerage uh, upgrades that have come in Morgan Stanley and ICICI Bank, they have maintained their overweight rating but have hiked the target price to 775 from 665. Now it says that large lenders are at a start of a super normal profit cycle and they say that ICICI is particularly well placed given the earnings upside and the lower valuations. On HDFC, Morgan Stanley has maintained its overweight rating but have hiked the target price to 2900 from 2600. Now they are saying that the ROE and EPS growth are poised to stage a multi year recovery and they are expecting a pickup in loan growth over the next 12 months for HDFC. Now for uh, uh, SpiceJet, HSBC has maintained its hold rating but have cut the target price to 115 from 130. Now they are saying that the subdued yield and cost pressures are risking the second half profitability and they, uh, they have cut their FY20 profit estimates by nearly 27% on the back of this. 
Thanks so much for that, Samit. Now, the political drama in Maharashtra seems to be drawing to a close, at least for now. The three-way alliance between Shiv Sena, NCP and Congress is set to form the government in Maharashtra. The coalition will be led by Sena Chief Uddhav Thakre as the Chief Minister. Kaushik Vaidya sums up the developments that got them here. At the end of a day of fast-moving political developments on Tuesday, the newly formed Shiva Sena NCP Congress Alliance that's named itself the Maharashtra Vikas Aghadi has put forth Uddhav Thakre's name as its leader and nominee for Chief Minister of Maharashtra. The alliance's leaders went to Raj Bhavan to stake claim hours after Devendra Fadnavis resigned as Chief Minister. Fadnavis's 80-hour long stint, second stint as Chief Minister, came to an end after Ajit Pawar sent in his own resignation as Deputy Chief Minister to Fadnavis. Without the support of any of the NCP MLAs that Ajit Pawar had seemingly committed to the BJP to bring towards Devendra Fadnavis, Fadnavis found himself well short of the halfway mark in the Maharashtra Assembly and unable to meet the floor test that was mandated by the Supreme Court in its order on Tuesday morning. Following these developments, the Maharashtra Assembly convenes today for new MLAs to take oath. All right, let's also listen in to what the NCP's Legislative Party leader, Jayant Patil, told media persons after their delegation met the Maharashtra governor. We have submitted our letters of support to Shiv Sena leader, Mr. Uddhav Thakre, and uh, we have requested Honorable uh, Governor uh, to... Uh, decide a day which we have requested him uh, uh, as uh, 28th of November. So mostly 28th November in the evening, 5 o'clock, uh, Mr. Uddhav Thakre will, uh, be, will take uh, swear oath and uh, along with him, uh, as he decides, number of ministers will take oath. All right, shifting gears now, the government at the centre has made it clear that only core manufacturing companies will be eligible to avail the lower corporate tax rate of 15%. The Taxation Laws Amendment Bill of 2019 lists out certain territory and ancillary businesses that won't be eligible for the lowest tax rate. Nikunj Ori of Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg Quint has the details. Only those new companies which are involved in mainstream manufacturing will be eligible to avail a lower corporate tax of 15%. According to the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill 2019, which was tabled in the Parliament, the law clearly specifies that certain companies which are not involved in mainstream manufacturing will not be eligible to claim a lower corporate tax of 15%. And these companies are companies that develop computer software those companies that are involved in mining, converting of marble into slabs, those companies bottling gas into cylinders, and those that print books and manufacture cinematograph films. The Taxation Law Amendment Bill 2019 also clarifies that companies that are trying to create a new firm just by transferring their old assets will not be able to avail the lower corporate tax and will not be eligible for, for paying the lower corporate tax of 15%. In case of a merger, the bill clarifies that a company will not be able to set off previous losses or unabsorbed depreciation of the pre-merged entity. All right, important clarifications coming in there. Let's take you through some of the stories you'll find on the website, BloombergQuint.com. Of course, you'll be able to read that one, first of all. Uh, another one for you. The initial public offering of CSB Bank, which was earlier called Catholic Syrian Bank, was subscribed nearly 87 times on the final day of bidding yesterday. The bank aims to raise 410 crore rupees from the IPO, out of which only 24 crore rupees is a fresh issue of shares. Now, the government is planning to introduce a lottery scheme to lure customers to pay goods and services tax, a step to improve compliance and plug tax leakages. The plan, which is still in an, a nascent stage, is to hold daily and monthly lotteries for customers who take a copy of the bill after paying GST for business-to-consumer transactions. All right, that's all you need to know going into trade today, but do stay tuned. There's clearly lots to talk about, and that'll start in just a short while. This is Bloomberg Quint.